University of Virginia Center for Politics. Good evening. I'm Larry Sabato, director of the Center for Politics, and we welcome you to the beginning of our fall programs, and we have a packed schedule for you. More about that to come, uh, but we're very pleased to be starting out in a positive, upbeat way with a, a great book and a great author. And uh, I'm going to introduce uh, both um, uh, the author and also the person who's going to be conducting the interview, who's an elected official and also is on our, on our uh, board at the Center for Politics. Uh, let me start with Ambassador Matthew Marzen. And uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for, for joining us and for doing this. He has been uh, U.S. Ambassador to the, to the uh, United Kingdom uh, in Northern Ireland. That's a, that's a prime ambassadorship, no question about it. He's also been U.S. Ambassador to Sweden. Uh, but I don't think his um, talk tonight will necessarily touch heavily on that, though he's welcome to do so. Uh, he has a long resume in government, politics, business. He was national finance chair for President Obama back in uh, the 2012 campaign. He started his career in technology at CNET, which was an early internet media company. Uh, I had the, the pleasure of receiving a a uh, galley copy of the book that you're going to see right now, which he's going to be presenting to you. If you can bring up the book there. Uh, the title is intriguing. The Power of Giving Away Power. The Power of Giving Away Power. I know he'll explain that to all of us. Uh, I like the subtitle, or rather my staff did. They kept underlining it. I don't know if they were giving me a hint, but the, the subtitle is How the Best Leaders Learn to Let Go. Was that a signal? They'll have to tell me later. But anyway, it's a great, uh, it's a great read. Uh, it's very useful. You, you learn something from it as well as enjoying the read. So I encourage you to purchase uh, that book at bookshop.org. That's one word, bookshop.org. And I'm sure Andrea will repeat that at the end again. Uh, we're, uh, as I said, we're grateful for you to, to come here uh, with us tonight. We'd hope to have this in the dome room at the Rotunda, but um, for the what, fourth semester, I guess, things aren't necessarily uh, going as well as we would have hoped because of the pandemic. Nonetheless, we're back in, uh, in session and we're having in-person classes, so things are improving. Uh, the ambassador was raised on the East Coast, he started his career on the West Coast, and he settled in the middle of the country in Louisville. So he knows uh, a good deal about all parts of America. Uh, he has three children, but the, the one, obviously, we're most concerned about uh, is uh, his daughter, who is a second-year student here at UVA. And we're delighted uh, that uh, she has decided to come here and has had well, kind of a year apart, but now at least she's here, and we hope uh, that she'll... Uh, get involved in the Center for Politics. Also, um, the ambassador's brother, Charles Barzen, is a professor of constitutional law up at our uh, law school. So uh, welcome, uh, Matthew. We're delighted to have you with us. And I'm going to introduce Andrea, who then will introduce you again, uh, because that's the way we do it here. I, Jefferson probably requested it. I don't know. Uh, Andrea McClellan, as a good friend and a former student of mine, I have to claim you. I, in my age, I claim everybody who was a former student because it's the only real legacy I've got left. Don't waste it, and you're not. Uh, Andrea is a member of, as I mentioned, the Center for Politics Board, but she is an elected member of the city council for my home city of Norfolk. And she's not just any old member from a regular district. She is... Uh, representing one of the big super wards in Norfolk, and maybe she'll tell you what that is, but it's a, a great honor to uh, be elected uh, from that super ward, and it's a great honor for us to have her here. Uh, she's going to be moderating the session, but she's also going to be calling on several of our students who have uh, prepared questions, uh, and uh, Andrea, I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you get started. Great. Thank you, Larry. It's so much fun to be here with you. I would have loved to have been in the dome room, but um, this is this is a close second. And um, have fun watching the gubernatorial debate later tonight, too. So uh, well, this is more important. 
this is more important. So forget about the gubernatorial debate. Yes. I can't, but I'm telling others, stay here. <laughs> well, we've got a, we've got a, a fun uh, hour ahead of us for sure. So, um, you know, I wanted to introduce uh, the ambassador and this amazing book. Um, I'll start with what Ken Burns said about the book, which I think was amazing. He, he talks about uh, that these are ideas that can heal and inspire in a time when we are suspicious, tribal, and at each other's throats. And I concur. And I really loved the book because for me, it offers hope for the future. Uh, it suggests that success comes from working together, not the winner versus loser mentality that has pervaded our political landscape. Um, it's about embracing our differences rather than alienating those who are not like us. And as said in the book, uh, diversity is a fact, inclusion is a choice, and co-creation is the work and interdependence is the promise. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, and that idea of interdependency is that idea of that constellation um, is what I see at the local level every day when my communities work together with various departments uh, to address some of the most important issues that we're facing in Norfolk and around uh, the Commonwealth and the world, whether it's affordable housing, the environment, broadband, or economic development. It's really all about connection and a leader's ability to make connections in ways where we can all succeed. Uh, I was introduced to a, a, an amazing woman in this book, uh, Mary Parker Follett, who is an extraordinary um, uh, uh, academician herself. And, and when you read more, um, I think you will also fall in love with her. But she did a study of speakers of the house and who was most successful. And, and basically, she said, said that successful leaders made their colleagues feel like they were generating power together and not like pawns in someone else's game. Another quote from the book that was really inspiring was from none other than President Barack Obama, uh, which is quoted, he's quoted as saying, be predisposed to see the power in other people. That's, I think, the name of the book. Uh, and then lastly, uh, uh, Matthew goes into great detail about the nation's seal, which I did not know about, uh, which includes a pyramid and constellation, as well as our great motto, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And so I'll, I'll end now and turn it over to Matthew, but I will say that for me, this book made me consider pronouns and prepositions. It's not about you or I, it's about we, and it's not power over, it is power with. And so speaking of with, it is my distinct honor to be with an incredible leader in his own right. And I turn the floor and the Zoom over to you, Ambassador Barzan, to talk about the power of Constellation leadership. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Larry, for those wonderful introductions. Um, I wish I could be with you all in the dome room, as you said, but I am joining you from the other great Commonwealth. Um, <laughs> Well, I should say, I, I'm being very undiplomatic. I mean, I was born in Boston, so we have that Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Kentucky, Commonwealth of Virginia. It all connects. Um, and uh, uh, I'm just honored to be here with you today. And, and we're on the eve of September 17th, right? And I was just thinking, like, there will not be tomorrow, um, I don't think, fireworks going off in the night sky across America, celebrating September 17th. And I think uh, there should be. Um, and it goes back to the story of uh, the founding of this country, July 4th, 1776. We celebrate that with fireworks. Um, and it turns out there were two declarations made that day, right? The famous one. But this other declaration they made, um, familiar to startups everywhere, was we need a logo. <laughs> And so they set out, and I won't do the full version, it's in the book, which by the way, thank you, you can get it at bookshop.org, you also can get it at Amazon or any other place you, you buy books, but bookshop.org is this really cool constellation of independent bookshops in whatever town and city you might be from. Um, but, uh, so anyway, they make this declaration, it took longer to design that logo than it did to win the war which is kind of amazing. And the one thing they figured out early on, Andrea, you talked about it, was the motto, because these folks were good with words. So they figured out the e pluribus unum from many one, but the, the symbols took them much longer. And they got the eagle, right, for the front. Oh, they also decided early on it ought to have two sides. Um, 
and they didn't call it a logo. They called it the great seal of the United States. And it was going to replace the dreaded stamp of King George. Um, and so they set about trying to design it and they came up with the eagle clenching the olive branches and then the, um, the arrows and the shield with the stripes. Uh, and they had all that, but they were missing this crucial element. And there was a formula for it back then. They were, they, they were missing what was called the crest. Now the crest was supposed to be the essence of the whole thing and it would go above the eagle's head. And after seven years, they finally come up with what they were looking for. And it was 13 stars of different sizes in an asymmetrical pattern with bright rays of sunlight beaming out from behind it. And they called it the radiant constellation. And it symbolized uh, the animating spirit of this new country, that it would be independent bodies freely choosing to make connections with one another to create something bigger, more powerful, more useful than they ever could on their own. And so I love this symbol, this radiant constellation. You can see it on the front of your passport, on the back of a dollar bill. Um, and it symbolizes, in a nutshell, our interdependence. Um, because any band of revolutionaries can declare independence. And look, I love July 4th as much as anyone on this call. Um, but what that symbol represents is something much more important and much harder and the best idea America ever had, which was not how do we be free from something or from someone like King George, how can we be free with one another, with and through one another? And obviously we fell tragically and hypocritically short of it then, and we still do, but we ought to strive for it. We did then, and then we tried to turn that idea into a constitution 234 years ago tomorrow. And so tomorrow is, what do we call it? The official name, Larry probably knows this. You probably know it, Andrea. It's, I looked it up. It is Constitution and Citizenship Day. Hmm. And I won't put these wonderful students on the spot, but like, what was your family tradition growing up? How did you celebrate Citizenship and Constitution Day? I think that'd be an awkward question because like most of us don't have traditions around that, right? And Interdependence Day is kind of a mouthful. So I would like to wish everyone tomorrow, but I'll do it prematurely, happy Constellation Day. Happy Constellation Day. You know, in uh, in the Commonwealth, it's also happy first day of voting. So oh, yes, also speaking catchy. Of, speaking of interdependence, um, it's a great opportunity for folks to go out and cast a ballot. So I, I'm curious, you know, uh, Larry went through, you have an incredible background um, and what actually motivated you to write a book? I mean, what was, what was the genesis of this? At what point did you say, you know, I think I, I want to um, sit down and, and write a book and where did this come from? Well, I think it stemmed from, when we talked about that logo just now in the front was the constellation, this wonderful symbol for interdependence. They did chose, they did choose an image on the back that I think we're all more familiar with. Uh, you can see both of them on the back of a US dollar bill, which they chose the symbol of a pyramid, right? Which symbolized back then anyway, sort of strength and durability of a certain kind. And if you think about it, um, the pyramid kind of represents the world of top-down hierarchy, the world of in, out, up, down, ranking, rating, sorting, sifting. I think everyone on the call is pretty familiar with that world. Almost every organization, academic, nonprofit, big business, small, so many of these businesses still are in that hierarchical mindset. And I think in my career from the internet days and then politics and then in diplomacy, I just got more and more attuned to how the limits and the load that that kind of mindset, that pyramid perspective of ranking and rating and sorting and sifting, I know it has its place and we can talk about that. And, and it has a kind of stability and a kind of order to it. It's just not the only stability and the only order. Um, and I saw how disempowering it could be um, and was sort of hungry for alternatives. And I saw it in leaders I got to work for and work with. And then I saw it in history, other places, and that's what got me to want to write the book, to talk about this different mindset and to show that there's this other way of thinking of ourselves and people around us. 
That's great. That's great. Well, we, you're talking about symbols. Um, you know, when I thought about constellation that, you know, the, the symbol for the EU, right. It's, it's a, it's a constellation. Well, um, although if you, does everyone, well, okay. I'm really into symbols now. It's sort of a geeky thing. So the, the European flag, European union flag is blue with the beautiful gold stars, but they're all in a perfect circle. Mm. And what I love, and I should have brought a thing to show, um, but the original drawing of the radiant constellation, stars of different sizes and asymmetrical. And I think now on the dollar bill and on your passport, if you're American, we've kind of tightened it all up and made it sort of neat and orderly, but the original design wasn't neat and orderly. And I think that's kind of important because imperfection is a big, is where a lot of energy lives, I think. And so the symbol, and I think maybe one of the, we can get into this if we want, like the idea of like, oh, everything's perfect in a circle. It's like, no, it's not. And so if you start, if you start off pretending, the first three words of the book are pretending is exhausting. Mm. And I think there's so much pretending that we're all asked to do in, in many facets of our lives. Certainly anyone who's been asked to be in a leadership position as a volunteer or professionally, you name it. Um, there's so much pretending, pretending we know the right answer and let's work, pretending we know the right goals to set. Let's work backwards from there, that sort of thing. Well, I was, you know, I was going to talk about, um, the EU, now that we know that, you know, that perfection is not really where you're going with that, but constellation, but, um, you know, you talk about in the book, your experience as ambassador to Sweden, uh, and then obviously as ambassador to the UK and I'm curious how you see, um, sort of that constellation of EU now, uh, with one less constellation in it, uh, through Brexit. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of that. Well, it's funny when I, when I, I got over to London 2013, and I met a, now a friend, but then a new friend, who said, wow, your predecessor here had London 2012 Olympics and a royal wedding and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, and you're going to get Scottish the fight around Scottish independence. And then the term Brexit wasn't used then, but should the UK remain within the EU? And then a, what he thought at the time would be a deeply contested and he was right, uh, bitterly contested uh, 2016 presidential campaign to try to talk about uh, over there. But it was interesting. So, so my whole time over there serving in London was about um, connections and being who wanted to be part of something or not part of something. So it's, it's what I professionally was asked to think about and talk about all the time. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you did in terms of uh, going out and talking to high school students and what that yeah, experience it's, was? Um, like? uh, it's why it's great to have Isabel and Logan and Jack here with us and, and others, I hope, on the, on the call. So uh, Pew, Pew Charitable Research, that I'm sure everyone's familiar with, who do amazing work, they came out like a couple of weeks before I get there. They come out with this global study of, I think, 40 countries, and they basically ask um, people of all ages, you know, do you love the United States? Lukewarm, don't like the United States. And out of the 40 countries, 39 of the countries, young people, and I think that's people 25 and younger, had a more favorable opinion of the United States than their parents or grandparents did. And people weren't that surprised by that. And I think President Obama resonated with that age group quite well. Um, but the one country that didn't, the one country where young people didn't have a particularly high relative to their parents and grandparents' opinion of the United States was the United Kingdom. So I thought, okay, well, there's an opportunity. Um, so let's go try to find out why. And so I started going to high schools. And I knew one thing, and I do have three teenagers, um, one thing that young people in the UK didn't want, which was a lecture from an American ambassador. So I was like, I'm not going to do that, talking about foreign policy. Um, and I think that's important and everything, but I was pretty sure that's not what they would want. Uh, so we ended up doing this workshop where we would go to a school, we'd have 100 young uh, men and women there, and I would give them, I'm trying to think, I have one here, just like a blank card. 
and we had embassy pencils and we'd give them a pencil and we'd say, okay, draw one picture for me. You could doodle a picture, write a word, whatever works for you of something that frustrates, concerns, or confuses you about the United States and what we're up to. We'd do that. And then we would talk about it and we'd have to, you know, call, it'd be like, raise your hand if you want to share what you wrote. And then it would, you know, at first people would be kind of shy and then it became like microwave popcorn. Like you'd be like a few and then everyone sort of would raise their hand and we would talk about it. Um, and by the way, the, so I have in the room next to where I am now, 20,000 index cards with 20,000 pictures. Um, 10,000 of them have a picture of a handgun. So half the students either drew a picture of a handgun or wrote the word guns in terms of their frustration, confusion, and um, followed number two, and we made a word cloud um, of every time we updated the word cloud. So the top three, so guns, police brutality, and racism were the three biggest ones. That's true in 2013, 14, 15, 16, and I left at the beginning of 2017. Then I'd flip over. So we spent most of the time talking about that. And then we'd, at the end of the session, um, we'd flip over the card and say, okay, could you please write a picture or a word of something that inspires or gives you hope about the United States and what we're up to? Um, and there wasn't one word that jumped out more than any other, like guns on the other side. But we heard food, opportunity, diversity, innovation, words like that. And so... I, I just, I wouldn't go anywhere without doing those. And, and it was strange. I mean, they were always the same in some sense, but always different because it was a new group of people. And so I found that just asking people what they cared about. And then I kept it going back here when I returned home, even though I had no sort of official reason to do it. It was so fascinating every time. So I kept going in America, same format, but different answers. So Andrew, I learned, I didn't do it at the scale back home that I did there. But the number one frustration and concern for the Americans, this is now just in Kentucky and Southern Indiana, was division, mm -hmm. followed closely by loneliness. Mm -hmm. And then the number one hope was diversity, followed closely by freedom. And so if we just take the two top scorers, so to speak, division and diversity, they have the same root. They both have div. So what they love most and fear most have something to do with separateness. And that led again back to like, sort of what made me want to write this book. It's like, okay, so if you sort of jumping right to the end, you, these young people, and I think I certainly feel, I'm not at all young. Um, I felt what they felt, which is you want to stand out as your own person and fit into something greater. But in that pyramid mindset, which so often we either directly or indirectly sort of encourage the young to think that they're gonna go climb some pyramid, in the world of a pyramid, you either fit in or you are left out. Mm. Yeah. Or you're just told to like, hey, you're totally on your own, like one of a million stars in the night sky, good luck to you. And what's so powerful about the constellation as a mindset and as an image for us to keep, it's like, no, no, you by all means be yourself. You're a star, but everyone around you is a star. And what kind of connections are you going to make with them to make something bigger, to stand out and fit in? So I thought division and diversity, how do you get unity without uniformity? How do you get the power of diversity without succumbing to division? And I think interdependence, that great American idea is a really good answer. Again, we fall short, and you know, you see this all the time too, of it, but we should keep striving for it. Well, speaking of something that we could strive for, you mentioned in the book that um, our whole democracy hinges on tone. Um, and tone has been a real problematic issue for us in uh, politics. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, obviously this goes in waves, but um, you want to talk a little bit about tone and where you see us now and how we can get back to, you know, a tone where we can at least listen to one another? I know. It's a tricky one. I mean, look, I don't have any great answers. That was a quote from William James, who was the, the wonderful professor, philosopher, 
uh, co-founder of, co-creator of one of America's first original philosophies called pragmatism, um, and the favorite professor of Mary Parker Follett, who you talked about, who's kind of the matron saint, I think, of this mindset, this brilliant woman who's writing 100 years ago. She's totally, maybe we'll get into her later, but I mean, sort of lost, most, I mean, mostly people haven't heard of her work. And she was writing 100 years ago when America is, see if this strikes you as relevant, coming out of a global pandemic. Everywhere she looked, she saw racial, social, economic division, raging debates about fear of big business, equally raging debates, fear of government overreach in regulating big business or regulating people's lives. Sounds kind of familiar. Mm. And then she says, but look, we, we can do th those all sound kind of big and intractable, but there's something really practical and tactical we can do about it. Each of us, no matter what we're doing, where we are, we can do something about it, like at our next Monday morning meeting um, and the pattern and the tone we set in those meetings. As we think about um, speaking of um, that era and where we are now in pandemics, um, one of the things that's of course happened with pandemics is we have situations like we are in now, right? We're, we're all Zooming um, and we have a lot of workers that now are working remotely. They may or may not come back to corporate headquarters. Um, and as you think about the Constellation leadership model, I'm just curious how you see that helping or hindering corporate America in this new world, yeah. uh, new reality well, that we're in. I mean, we, uh, and these wonderful students, all of you are going to go out into this world after uh, UVA. And there are so many important debates going on um, where you should work. I mean, not what company, but like, will you, you know, when you read about these debates now, should you go back to the office all the time, some of the time? So a lot of discussion about where you work, a lot of discussion about when you work. And what I'm really eager to learn about, and I think we ought to spend a lot of time talking about, is how we work, sort of irrespective of where and when. And that's where Mary Follett comes in, because she, back to that practical, tactical advice of what we can do in our democracy to change the pattern and tone. She said, okay, look, wherever people are gathered around a table, virtual or real life, um, there are four possible outcomes of a meeting, and only one of them is worthwhile. Bad outcome number one, you try to win your idea, like win the meeting. She's like, why did you even invite anyone else? Right? You come in with an idea fully formed and just get them all to say yes and declare victory. That's no good. Number two bad outcome is the opposite. You just acquiesced. You're like, oh, you know, Mary or Mark seem super fired up. Let them have their way. It's like, no, 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 you can't do that. Why are you at the meeting? You're depriving that group of a unique perspective, like your own, right? That's no good. Bad outcome number three, and this is tough because I certainly was told, I'm sure, Andrea, you were told that this is what we ought to search for. Bad outcome number three, compromise. Mm -hmm. And she said, um, and, and I'll tell you, the, the, well, I'll get back to this in a second, but she said, compromise isn't really any good. It's just sort of little mini victories and mini acquiescences. At best, you, you, you come into the meeting with like a full idea you think you want to win, and you end up with a subset of it. Um, so the only reason she thinks we should ever get together is to co-create, to make something together. Now, it could be a physical thing. It could be a product roadmap. It could be a whiteboard sketch of what might become a product. It could be make a determination about what the new COVID policy ought to be for the next month. I mean, it really doesn't matter as long as you're making something. And this magic thing happens that uh, it doesn't happen enough, but a magic thing happens when you make something as a group, which is you are forever part of that thing you made. It is forever part of you. And you aren't diminished in the process, like you are enhanced. And everyone leaves that meeting enhanced by the thing they made. And so I reflect on her wisdom and I think, okay, there are three things that each of us should bring into our next encounter, three expectations. One, expect to be needed, bring your full self, right? Number two, expect to need others. Um, three, and this is the one that is the most important and the hardest expect to be changed. 
And it really flows from that first one. It's like, by all means, bring your full self. But if you've made something with other people, then you ought to leave that meeting just a little bit different than you entered it. So that the next time you bring your full self, it's an enhanced self you're bringing, and you don't just keep bringing your same self, because that leads to stagnation and ultimately leads to loneliness and alienation. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, um, you, you talk about some campaigns use um, the terminology of winning um, and how important it is to win um, and how that's really not really what we should be thinking about. But to, to your point, how, how do we create? I, I just find it, it's, it's a lovely idea and I completely agree with it, um, but it's very difficult in circumstances where not all parties want to be part of that co-creation. Well, I know. And look, you live it right in, in, in your uh, city council road in Norfolk. I, I just now I learned how to maybe mispronounce your hometown. Um, I'm learning. Um, but OK, so it is, I think, hard to imagine in our political situation right now. And it could be city council for you with folks from different parties. Um, let's say our nation's capital, not too far away from Charlottesville top Democrats, top Republicans sitting down and co-creating. That may feel like kind of hard to imagine. I just want to take it one step sort of closer and say, okay, let's say that's kind of too hard to imagine. Not impossible, but kind of hard. What if it's just the Republicans or just the Democrats? So I have, I'm a Democrat, so let's talk about Democrats for a second. Just folks in the Biden administration sitting around a table, someone from the State Department, the fancy name is the interagency, right? So someone from the State Department, someone from Treasury, someone from the White House, right? All sitting around trying to work on fill in the topic. The problem is, I think, that this kind of pyramid perspective of win, lose, in, out, which you kind of bring to maybe red versus blue, Republican, Democrat, that pattern of behavior, that tone you take, permeates all the way back in. So now you're all on the same blue team, right? You're all in the same administration, but now it's like, ooh, the people at state don't trust the people at treasury, right? That's sort of a famous thing, Republican and Democrat. Well, let's go even further. So now you're just at a meeting with people in the State Department. But people from the public diplomacy team might be slightly skeptical of the people from the economic team or the political team. So where does that stop? And it just keeps going at any scale that sense of I'm going to win, someone's going to lose, I'll be up, they'll be down. And it's exhausting. It's not productive. Um, and it doesn't seem too far-fetched to just ask within the Republican Party or within the Democratic Party to try out a different um, tone. And here's an example. So later tonight, there is the debate between uh, for the Commonwealth of Virginia, for your statewide uh, gubernatorial. Um, so if you remember March of, this is not too long ago, March of 2020, I think right as COVID is shutting everything down, uh, and I think it was CNN, but it doesn't really matter. There was one debate that was still on the books, right? So Biden, I think at that point, was going to win it. I mean, the math was pretty clear, but it wasn't official yet. So it was going to be a Biden and Bernie sort of final debate. And then, so the newspapers were writing about it. It's like, well, should you cancel it or should you continue it, right? OK. And I thought, and I knew this was far-fetched, but I thought it shouldn't be. Why couldn't you have done a third option, which is use the, assuming you could do it safely with COVID. It's not a COVID uh, thought experiment. It's, it's either you have a debate or you cancel it. It's like, well, what if you had Biden show up and Bernie and um, Senator Warren and Senator Harris and Mayor Pete, but all the folks from the blue team who had been on that screen over the previous 12 months who had dropped out and bring them back for, brace for it, a discussion. And I, I pitched this to someone, they're like, well, that would be boring. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe not. But by the way, the food fight that we watch on TV isn't exactly compelling or 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 nutritional either. So it wouldn't be crazy just to give it a shot. 
And so just imagine Senator Warren says, or, or, or Biden, candidate Biden says to Senator Warren, Senator Warren, you've studied this stuff. You're really smart. You've studied healthcare really much. You think my position is middle of the road, mushy, and you've said worse, but like just kind of lame. Do, and help me understand what you think I'm misunderstanding, I'm being hoodwinked. Like, just tell me. And I would be fascinated to hear her reaction or Senator Harris or Mayor P or all these other people where they're trying to, and look, there would be jockeying for all, I mean, human nature would be on display, but it wouldn't be to try to win. Okay. It would be try to make your ideas more clear. So maybe he would uh, change his thinking a little bit. You could maybe, maybe make something together and well, let I America watch people have a constructive disagreement. I'd like to think that that happened um, post-election and that uh, the president is having those those discussions. They're just not on display for everybody to see. Although that does sound a little bit like top chef when, you know, you bring all the other chefs who didn't make it to the finals, come back and help the finalists. So uh, at any rate, I don't know. But that's um, so weird. I mean, I have to say, so I, so I love to cook. I'm not like a top chef or anything, but I think it is so weird that we, so I love to cook. I love to have people over. And actually, they filmed a reality show at the end of my time in London at the ambassador's residence, one of those shows. It is the weirdest, non-real, non-hospitable, non-culinary, not any pos positive word you would use, put the word non in front of it. it. It chops up what in normal life at any scale is the making of food into a meal and the sharing it with people, like magic lives there, and how to make it into an awful gladiatorial blood sport of people crying and breaking down in tears and being told, like, for food. And I get why it makes sort of good reality television. It makes for bad real reality. And we ought, and it, it perpetuates the same bad mindset. And, you know, and it's just pretending. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, there are so many um, fun things about in the book and I've taken away some of your, um, your terms. I think you had uh, at the embassy um, something called one, one network agency, but you translate it to being only need everybody. And oh yeah. Yeah. I love that concept. Um, and I thought about that, you know, and what I do on a daily basis, because, you know, it's for a city to work, there's just so many pieces of, uh, of the puzzle, but if not everybody's working together, it just doesn't, it doesn't coalesce to, to solve the problems. Um, well, in that, in that particular case, Andrew, it was, there were these wonderful, I mean, this has probably existed for, I'm making it up now, but I mean, decades and decades and decades, what was called the office of protocol. And these are hardworking, smart people, but over the years, what the job had become or what they thought the job was, was just how to keep people out. And so we got really good at not letting people come and engage with either the embassy or the ambassador or whatever it might be. And beyond the obvious security reasons for wanting to do that, it just became an exercise in saying no. And what you end up doing is you end up really valuing people who have fancy, powerful titles on their business cards. Those people come and go, but the, the title, you know, CEO of blank or minister of blank, that's always the same, and then different people occupy it. And that just becomes kind of the pattern and the tone that's set by that group. But I looked around and I thought, well, some of the most interesting people I know are under 30, so they don't have interesting things on their business card, but they're really interesting people. Oh, and by the way, they don't really think what America's up to is so great. And they're going to be 60 one day. So like we should learn from them and, you know, engage with them. And weirdly in a typical protocol setting, we tune out everyone after they're over 60, just when they have a whole lifetime of wisdom to offer who aren't, don't have some job that they have to sort of pretend have an official position, they can bring their full selves to an encounter and share their wisdom with us. So we wanted to have lots more 30 year olds, lots of more people over 60 sort of in the mix. So we changed it. We didn't call it protocol. We called it Office of Network Engagement, mm -hmm. O-N-E. But then those words like network 
which I think is, like, I was like an internet guy. So I love that word, but, and I'm curious what the students think later, but that word network, oof, it's been, it's like a verb and a noun. It's like, hey, I'm going to grow my networking by networking at this network event, right? Verb, adverb, adjective, you name it, noun. That's kind of exhausting. So anyway, it didn't, and it sounded kind of buzzwordy. So then we just called it o.n.e. So then I started thinking of it, like you said, as only need everybody. And that just kind of changes. Changes the dynamic for sure. So uh, out of curiosity, uh, I'll ask this question and then we'll turn it over to the students. Um, so what's next for you? I mean, you've been um, you've ambassador to two different countries. You run a, a national presidential finance campaign. You've been part of a, a successful internet startup. How do you put the constellation leadership style to work after you get through your your book tour and you sell millions of these books? What's oh, next? Well, I love it. Um, you're going to run for office? Uh, well, I'm loving this. I really love the mode I'm in right now, which is, um, I mean, it's fun. And I've so enjoyed Andrea talking to you and to Larry about where this sort of this core idea resonates. I'm equally interested in where people think it doesn't. And I have a whole list I've collected from readers. Um, from Zooms like this and from other sessions um, where I call them, I file them under a, I call my, the documents called, yeah, comma, but dot, dot, dot. And it's kind of like, yeah, but I don't see how it could apply here or here or here. And that's really fun for me to think about that and engage with them. And so I like this. I want to keep doing this, not only for this book, but really just for the idea behind it. I've already started working on another one. Um, which gets kind of more practical and tactical about how and where this might apply in different parts of our lives. Um, so that's it. And so running for office isn't something that appeals to me right now. Good. Well, I'm not good, but um, <laughs> I think you'd be, I, uh, it, it's tough to run for office, as you know, because you've been part of a presidential campaign. Well, you really know. Yeah, it's a, uh, um, it's, it's, it is a blood sport, unfortunately. Um, so I, it was so refreshing for me to have just come from running, um, statewide to, uh, sit down and, and read this book. Um, and I really appreciate your, um, your thoughtfulness and, and I learned a lot from it too. So, um, let's, let's introduce some of the, these great students who are here with us to, uh, ask some questions as well. I'm just going to go around. Um, uh, and I'll start with Isabel uh, Delabach, who's a second year student uh, who has a question for you. Isabel, you want to unmute and ask? Hi, yes, thank you so much for being here. Um, how does one go from a college student to US ambassador to Great Britain? Do you have any advice for young adults considering careers in government and foreign affairs? Thank you, Isabel. Um, wow, okay, um, not linear. Um, is certainly, uh, I mean, I majored in history and literature of America, um, which I, mean, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I went to college. Um, and uh, so it, it, this was not uh, for me, like a mountain I wanted to climb or a goal I wanted to get to. And I work backwards. Some people operate that way. I didn't. Um, I think, um, but if you go to the end, I mean, on the ambassador side, there's kind of two ways to do it. Um, the, the, the foreign service is an amazing way to do it. And I'm sure you know from the Center for Politics um, and others, all the great connections that UVA has to the State Department and a great tradition of sending great folks like you into the State Department, um, either at the beginning of their career or there's a great mid-career track, too. Um, so that is, you know, and the number changes, but 75% of our ambassadors come from the career foreign service as they should. And then 25% are people like me who come from outside. Um, and I think I would think this, I mean, you know, it's controversial. Some people think there should be zero people from the outside like me. I get that. I respect that. I think um, if the mix was too much outsiders like me, that wouldn't be healthy. So um, and sometimes that percentage has been more like 60, 40. So, um, and for those like me coming from the outside, it usually means you've been engaged with a presidential campaign. So if you want to go that route, I think volunteering on a campaign is 
amazing. Um, field organizing, fundraising, whatever it might be. That's usually one of the two things. If you raise your hand and volunteer, they rarely say, and Isabel, you may be a wonderful exception. They certainly didn't say to me when I did it, ooh, please help me think about policy. Um, you know, and, and that's an important piece, but really organizing on the ground for field organizing or organizing resources to fund that, which is what's called fundraising. And by the way, as someone who did that, it gets given an awful name for a lot of good reasons. I mean, money and politics, there's plenty to be grossed out by. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. And it isn't always that way. And certainly I loved my experience and a lot has changed in our laws about it. But um, when I got into it, but it's amazing. I mean, you're organizing money to help a cause greater than yourself that you believe in. And that's good training for the candidate you care about. And that's a good skill to develop for a cause you care about later. Um, in addition to that, and you get told no a lot. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, it's a great, I think, great way to develop a constellation mindset. Does that help, Isabel, at all? Yes, thank you so much. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Um, I want to bring on um, Jack Phoenix, who also has a question. If you want to unmute yourself, Jack. Jack's a fourth-year student uh, at the Center for Politics. Hello. Yes. Thank you for having us. I really enjoyed what you've had to say so far. And my question has a little bit more to do with some of the work that you did in Sweden. After doing some uh, cursory research, I saw that the prime minister, uh, Stevie and Lovian, uh, recently received a vote of no confidence um, and then parliamentary acceptance of the finance minister, Magdalena Anderson, as a replacement is uncertain. So I was wondering how the book's power sharing thesis is unique to parliamentary democracies and their party dynamics, uh, specifically Sweden. Um, if there's any anecdotes, of course, from your time in Sweden, um, I'm sure we'd love to hear hear those. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting. I think a common misperception, and I totally understand why it happens. Um, and the title, it's so strange. I use the word power twice in my title. It is a word that I studiously avoided using in my internet days, in my political fundraising days, and certainly as a diplomat. Like, I don't know what you think, Jack. It's such a loaded word. Could be really positive. I find that it's, for many people I talk to, it's certainly equally or maybe sometimes even more so has negative connotations associated with it. But I think we got to talk about it, which is why I wrote the book. Um, and these leaders and the mindset they adopted that I talk about in the book... Um, they don't think power is something you should lord over other people. Okay, that makes sense. They, they don't think it's something you should just hoard to yourself. And this is controversial. They don't even think it is something to be divvied up and shared. So power sharing certainly sounds better than lording power over mm -hmm. others. Except I think there's something... The, the downside of power sharing is that it implies often, not always, but often implies there's only so much to go around. And parliamentary stuff can, can kind of exacerbate this in a way I'll get into in a moment. But And so it's kind of like sharing sort of kindergarten style, like, hey, you have four blocks in front of you. Why don't you share two with Janie or Jimmy, right? And so it's like, oh, okay, I don't keep all four. But it's sort of, but these great leaders figured out and by the way, these are leaders, and we didn't get into it today, but who went on to found some of the most consequential organizations and innovations that we all take for granted every single day, like the biggest commercial organization, Jack, in the history of the world, Visa, the internet, Wikipedia, the largest personal recovery platform in the world, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, all very different sounding, but they have at their core... Um, this idea that power isn't something that is scarce, that you have to divide up, like something you mine, like coal in Southwest Virginia or Eastern Kentucky. Power is something you make, and you make it with other people sitting around a table, and it is infinite if you bring the right mindset to it. 
Um, and so in parliamentary systems, it's often like, well, hey, if I've got to keep the math simple, 10 cabinet slots and my co my governing coalition is 60% this, so you get six, you know, you get three and you get one. It sort of gets into that division game. But all the power comes from multiplication, um, I think, and not division. So the anecdote that I take from Sweden, I mean, too many to get into, um, but, but as a mindset, so Sweden is famous for a whole bunch of things. One of them is safe driving, right? So they make Saab and Volvo. And in fact, they have like a safe driving institute that I got to go visit early days. So they have everyone hooked up. They have like real life drivers that wear these head mounted displays so they can see how real people actually drive. And it is terrifying, right? And I'm sure I mean, anyone driving around Virginia knows this, right? It's like people do really dumb stuff. So you, I get to watch these people driving. And so and the way you can watch it in, in the center when you go monitor it is there's a little red X for wherever the driver is looking, right? So it will surprise no one on this call um, that a whole bunch of people are driving and staring at their phones in their lap. That is called distracting dri distracted driving. And it won't surprise you that that can kill you. What is not so intuitive is if you do the exact opposite of that, Jack, if you just look at the road ahead of you and only at the road in front of you and that little red X never moves from the road in front of you, that'll kill you too. And it's called, it's like focus, focus, focus. It's called tunnel vision and it causes a lot of crashes. So it turns out that, and I learned this at the center and I actually learned it in driver's ed. I just didn't really retain it in quite the same way that so you don't, distraction is obviously stupid. Focus sounds right, but it can kill you too. Engage safe driving. That little red X should move. Yes, look ahead of you, but then look in the rear view mirror, the side view mirror, the side view mirror, way down the road, close up the road, rear view mirror. The little red X should move every two seconds. And if you look at like a scatter plot of what a safe driver looks like, it has all these little red X's and it looks a lot like a constellation. And that's how I, that's what I took from Sweden, which is like, just avoid distractions more obvious, avoid being told to focus, 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 and look around literally and figuratively. And like that great quote from my former boss, um, be predisposed to see the power in other people. And if you bring that mindset to it, you can unlock all sorts of new connections. That's great. Well, I want to bring in our last uh, our last student here, uh, Logan Vandewater, who's also a fourth year student at the Center for Polix Politics. Logan, thanks for being here tonight. And what is your question for the ambassador? Hi, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I'm hoping to ask about um, your work with young professionals. And um, I know one of your priorities was the promotion of American values and ideals. And I'm interested in how you would define those, um, whether you would advocate the same ones today or if you've seen them evolve during your career, and to speak on that. Thank you, Logan. I mean, it kind of gets back to what I was talking to Andrea about, which is, um, and this is where I think diplomats, we can often run into trouble. Um, well, so... The weird thing, okay, if you are, if you come onto campus and you say to someone that you meet early on, hey, I'd like to be friends, that sounds kind of great and logical, except it's kind of creepy and it rarely leads to good friendships. And diplomats make that mistake all the time. It's like if someone says, trust me, the first thing you think is like, what? That's weird. I think trust, understanding, friendship, all these things aren't achieved by aiming at them. They are byproducts of something else. And so if you show up to a bunch of young professionals and say, America believes in freedom and opportunity and you know, just start listing values at people, it's just so off-putting. And it's just like, they may start out like this. They will very quickly, and I've tried it, like they'll just start to fold their arms and just be like, stop preaching at me, which is what I tried to do and imperfectly for sure. But if you ask people what their hopes and fears are, 
so my little cheat sheet, and it's, I, don't know, I should have a blank piece of paper with me at all times. So I'm gonna do it here, live. Um, can you see that? It spells also. Okay, that is my cheat sheet. A-L-S-O, all lowercase. And I'm going to contrast that with also spelled with all uppercase letters. So I'll start with, so everyone, and you guys have gotten to your point in your education, and this was certainly true in the State Department, everyone is really encouraged to be good at the capital A also. And here's it's like argue, lecture, strategize, and organize. And you will be rewarded for being good at those things, and we all are, and, and I get that. And there is a time and place for that. But, and I used to do this, you, a hundred group of kids like, hey, how many, quick show of hands, how many people here like to lose an argument? And except for some like obnoxious boy in the back, almost no one ever raises their hand, right? Because it's like, no one likes to lose an argument. So why do we spend so much time and effort training and encouraging and rewarding argument winning? Right, I get it. I mean, there's a, in our legal system and in debates, I mean, it, it is part of what we do. It's just not all we do. And we get tunnel vision around thinking that arguing and lecturing and strategizing and organizing are the only things that matter. So that enters the other also, which is lowercase a, ask other people about their hopes and fears. Step number two, link them to your own hopes and fears. Step three, serve whatever that overlap is. And four, open up. And if you do that, and that's what, Ob that's what I got to watch Senator Obama do in a cornfield in August when he's 28 points down to a much more well-known, very capable candidate that he was up against in 2007, just over and over again, ask, link, serve, open up. And it's kind of simple and it's hard, but if you do that, trust, respect, and understanding emerge. Like friendship emerges from sort of doing hard, laughing together, crying together, you know, all that stuff that you do in personal friendships, these other things emerge. And so I think trust between countries is much more similar to that than it is different. So do hard things together, have hard conversations together at any scale, and that will lead to those things that you talked about. Thanks, Logan. Thanks, Logan. Well, we're going to have to wrap it up, unfortunately, but, um, you know, the, the book was great, um, hearing you talk about it, it's even better. And, um, I, you know, Matthew, you and I both have three kids each. Um, and, and I, I was reading this book and I was thinking to myself, how in the world can I implement constellation leadership as a parent? I don't, does that even, is that possible? Well, my lovely daughter, who's at UVA, laughed when she when the book finally arrived in its real form, and she saw the subtitle across the top, which is how the best leaders learn to let go. She was like, oh, yeah. When's a good time to let go as a parent? And uh, I am certainly not practicing what I'm preaching in the realm of parenting. And I think, Andrea, are we, you know, our whole generation of parents have just need to learn how to let go a lot better than than I do, certainly. I won't, I won't paint you with that same brush, but, but that is a big challenge to me in an area I'm trying to get better at. Well, I think the great thing about this book is that it can be applied on so many different levels, whether it's um, uh, politics, it's business, it's our personal lives and relationships and interactions, um, but there's something for everybody. And so if you haven't purchased it yet, uh, I would highly encourage you to take a look at it uh, you can listen to, to the audiobook, and Matthew reads it himself and does a great job there. Uh, and Or you could purchase it on Amazon.com or bookshop.org, which supports our local booksellers, which we love. It's a great constellation. And I would encourage you all also to go to centerforpolitics.org to learn more about upcoming events, to sign up for the Crystal Ball newsletter. I'm proud to be a member of the Center for Politics Advisory Board and the great work uh, that's happening there and at the University of Virginia. And to the students who are here, best of luck to you uh, on grounds this year and stay well, stay safe. And for everybody who's here, thank you for tuning in. 
uh, Admiral, Admiral, I'm going to give you an Admiral, Ambassador uh, Matthew Barzum. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you for being here this evening with us. Uh, and thanks for the Center for Politics. Take care, everybody. Be well. Good night. Mm -hmm.